Welcome everyone to the Colonial Society of Massachusetts for our special talk, a conversation with Bob Gross about the transcendentalists in their world. I'm Bob Allison, the president of the Colonial Society. And this is a conversation. And if you do have questions or comments during it, please put them either in the Q&A or in the chat at the bottom of the screen so that I will get to them and be able to convey them to um, Professor Gross and welcome everyone. And I wanna thank Ann Cessary, who is chair of our programs committee for helping to arrange this and Mary Blunt, who is working behind the scenes to make this all go smoothly. And as I said, our guest tonight is Bob Gross, uh, Professor Robert Gross, actually a native of New England. He was born in Bridgeport and he has been a member of the Colonial Society since 1986, which was at about the same time he was working on the volume in the conference in Debt to Shades, which is one of our publications, the Bicentennial of an Agrarian Rebellion. And at that time, I believe he was a professor at Amherst College, where he was from uh, 1976 until 1988. And then he was at the College of William and Mary from 1988 to 2003. And subsequently, he was the James and Shirley Draper Professor of Early American History at the University of Connecticut. And in all of that time, he was busy with a lot of editing projects, the William and Mary Quarterly, other places as an essayist. And he was also working on Concord. He began his work on the town of Concord in 1970, when he and his wife Anne visited the town and he was looking to do a New England community study. And now he's done two extraordinary New England community studies. His first book, The Minutemen and Their World, which came out at about the time of the Bicentennial, deals with the Minutemen and the social history of Concord up to the revolution. And it received the Bancroft Prize in 1977. And he has just published The Transcendentalists and Their World, which is a look at Concord in the 19th century. So Bob, thank you for joining us. There we go. <laughs> Thanks for having me. So um, we were just talking before um, the program started about the generational tension between, uh, and Emerson seems to be dealing a lot with the younger generation and this uh, tremendous changes going on in Concord. I know I'm fumbling with a question and I know you will be able to say something about why Concord and what's happening in Concord to drive this particular change. Well, first, if you stand back from Concord specifically, and just think about how we understand American history. We often make generational change and conflict a key theme. And that seems to be in important ways inherent in social existence, one generation rises, lives its life, passes off the baton to the next. Sometimes, and Emerson probably, if he were giving a lecture in Boston would say, for most of history, ordinary people have been anonymous. We hardly know that. We only know of kings and generals and battles. This is what he said to open his lecture series on the philosophy of history in Boston. And, uh, late 1836, early 1837. But generational change struck him as particularly acute at the moment he spoke in 1837. He had a sense that, that New England and America was in the midst of a conflict over what it would, in, in, over what inheritance it would take from the previous generations. You know, think about how he begins this little book, Nature, in 1836. You know, our age is retrospective. We build the sepulchers of the fathers. Can we not have an original relation to the universe and live for ourselves? Well, now if I step back from that, generational tension and change is also a central theme in the Minutemen in their world. In that book, the theme of generational change comes out of the fact that um, by the eve of the revolution, the land had been pretty much parceled out in Concord. 
and that most young people, especially young men, if they wanted a farm, would have to move elsewhere. They sought to be like their fathers and women, like their mothers, to carry on the same way of life, but they couldn't do it in Concord because the land was running out. Now let's jump ahead uh, to the mid 1820s and stuff. In a sense, everybody knows you can't, if you're growing up on a farm, all but one son can inherit it, if that. But the tensions now are not so much just economically driven. They're, they're much more one of an older way of life now seems out of date, now seems to be uh, a, an errant guide to how you should live. And as people, as a, as a rising generation, looked at the world that was about to enter, it faced two problems. On the one hand, the, the traditions and customs and practices of the past no longer felt right and relevant. But at the same time, the world that was emerging of conquered uh, integration into global capitalism, of industrial revolution, of popular democracy, of voluntary associations, of religious pluralism, of racial diversity. That world also threatened to overwhelm people. And so Emerson speaking to a moment in which he sees a lot of young people, he really means Harvard graduates like Henry David Thoreau, who say, how do I enter this world? What do I do? I don't want to give up the freedom I sense that I now can have to accommodate a world that's unsympathetic. And yet I can't just live in the past. And so Emerson is trying to, to urge everyone that they have their own moment in history if they don't embrace it. And you mentioned the, it, it, the book is a tremendous social history of Concord, the first half is someone just compared it to our town. And you downplay, you, we know that Emerson and Thoreau are coming and they are a feature in the second half. But one of the things you do really well is capture the spirit of this town and the real conflict in it. And actually, you know, we are approaching the 250th anniversary of the beginning of the revolution and their plans to do various commemorations. Can you tell us a bit about Concord commemorating the 50th anniversary and then, the, and then in the 1830s? I mean, this is an extraordinary story of this town either trying or not trying to commemorate this in the midst of all of this tremendous conflict? Well, I think there are two things to reflect on here before I tell you more about the narrative story. One is that in the revolution in 1775, patriots mobilized, not simply because they didn't like taxation without representation. They were furious at the revocation of their charter and what they took to be an assault on the way of life they'd inherited from the Puritans, which is to say that they rebelled with a deep historical consciousness of their debts to the Puritan fathers and, the, and, the, and the, their sons and grandsons after them. And so loyalty to the past, however mythologized that past was, was crucial to them. And so after the revolution, after April 19th, People in Concord took pride in, we were the place where the War of Independence had to start. And in 1790 and as in 1775, Lexington wasn't giving a big argument because when war broke out in 1775, it was essential to say that the men on Lexington Common were the innocent victims of the British aggression, mowed down without ever prov provoking the war. And Concord, the shots had to be fired first by the British regulars at the North Bridge, but after that, Concord was the place where the war started. So from 1790 on, Concord takes great pride in uh, where the place where the revolution began. And this becomes part of the civic identity of Concord. Now we jump to the 50th anniversary of the Battle of Concord, and Concord is still taking great pride on where the first place. Lexington is no longer happy to be second fiddle. And so there's a great movement within Lexington to gather up and make the case for where the place where the revolution started. What provoked this is that the year before 1824, Lafayette comes to Concord 
And on the formal occasion, Samuel Hoare of Concord gets up and says, we're the first place where shots were exchanged between Americans defending their land and the British invaders. It's that speech by Samuel Hoare that really sets off Lexington. Now, it remains the case that from 1790 to 1825, Concord has not erected any monument to the revolution. They tried a couple of times to get money from um, the state legislature and failed. Lexington, meanwhile, has actually gotten money from the state legislature and built its monument. So it's 1825, and it looks like Concord can still have done nothing. But the Bunker Hill Memorial Association gets in touch with Concord and says, you know what? If you throw in with us in our fundraising, we'll come up with a plan for you to have and help you build a monument in Concord. Two conditions. One is it's got to look exactly like the big obelisk we're planning on Bunker Hill. And two, you need to put it in the center of town. Well, center of town is a great idea for the merchants and innkeepers of Concord, but not so much for others. And what I tell in, this, in the book is the story of the bitter conflict in Concord that lasted a dozen years over where to put a monument, how to fund it, and what to inscribe on it. And the highlights of the story are, to bring this to a, a shorter close, the highlights of the story are that Concord in 1825 on April 19th, marking the 50th anniversary of the battle, has a formal ceremony to lay the cornerstone in Masonic fashion with the local lodge uh, carrying out its rituals to dedicate the monument. Unfortunately, there are a lot of people still unhappy about this who are so angry that they build a mock monument of boards and barrels of tar that they place atop the foundation with a sign saying, this is a monument to the battle that happened a half mile from here. Well, the people who wanted the monument in the center of town were angry at the mock monument. So somebody torched it. Unfortunately, it's not a good idea to torch barrels of tar. <laughs> and the conflagration ruined the foundation that had just been laid. So Ezra Ripley, the Minister of Concord, sorely wants there to be a monument. And he keeps pushing the move to build it somewhere near the battle site. The battle site, meanwhile, has been inaccessible because at Ripley's urging, the town took down the North Bridge and relocated it on a different route north of town. Uh, Ripley, meanwhile, had appropriated land from the road to the battle site into his own estate. So um, many people think, uh, and he then offers to donate to the town the land for a battle site which is the land that he'd appropriated from the county and down. Um, the fight goes on and on. And finally, around 1836-37, the town accepts his offer of the land. Uh, and yet even then, the committee to devise the inscription is bitterly conflicted. Uh, and after they finally agree on an inscription, They've missed even the dedication of the monument in April of 1837. Finally, on July 4th, 1837, they dedicate the monument and a chorus is there to sing the Concord hymn and Henry David Thoreau is a member of that chorus. But Ralph Waldo Emerson who wrote the Concord hymn, he's out of town. He hadn't planned on being there. So the question is, is the dedication and celebration a moment of victory or is it a slightly bitter afterthought? Mm. Lest anyone think that Ezra Ripley, who said he appropriated the land and wanted to donate it back with some kind of self-interested land uh, baron, he was the pastor of the first church of the Unitarian church. And he happened to live in the old man, what becomes the old man's next to it. It's a uh, Great story. It tells us something about commemorations. Then, of course, the Masons are involved and you, uh, the anti-Masons, the tension between Masons and the anti-Masonic movement 
loom large in the book as they did in Concord at the time. Yeah, the uh, anti, basically anti-Masonry is the vehicle for a political explosion in Concord that takes place somewhat later. We, we think of the um, anti-Masonic movement as dating back to 1826 in the um, burned over district of New York uh, when Daniel Morgan, or when William Morgan, um, a printer exposes um, the secrets of masonry and he's seized and is never seen again until his body washes up. And, um, but quite some time after that, Concord finally responds to the currents of anti-masonry. And without going into that long story here, what one can say is a crucial aspect is that John Kyes, a Republican, for Jeffersonian Republican, turned national Republican who will turn Whig, he's the most powerful political figure in Concord. He's also a prominent Mason. And as a Ripley, minister of the town from 1778 to 1841, is also strongly identified with Masonry. And the crucial thing is that in 1837, the year that um, the monument will be dedicated. Kais is, loses his last hold on political power. And Ezra Ripley, after 1834, uh, is no longer uh, head of a publicly supported religious establishment. So his world, Ripley's world comes crashing down. And at the very moment that Ripley's step-grandson, Ralph Waldo Emerson, is going to give the American Scholar Address, later the Divinity School Address. Mm -hmm. And Ripley looks on his grandson, rejecting what he sees as his world of religion and community. And he brands the transcendentalist ego mites. <laughs> ego mites, by which he means they appoint themselves on their own mission. Mm -hmm. One of the uh, subtexts here, which you point out, is this change from this communal world, the world of we must be knit together as one man, to this individualistic world, which you can see in this trajectory from Ezra Ripley to his step-grandson, Ralph Waldo Emerson. Yeah, yeah and I, I think a crucial thing here is, and the way I structured the book is to really show this, is that starting say with the beginning of the new republic and accelerating in the 1820s to a kind of crisis point around 1837 or so, um, people are pulling away from the older way of life. The set of cooperative practices and inclusive institutions, which however flawed and not fully inclusive they were and however not entirely cooperative as they were, nonetheless made up what John Adams would describe as the New England way. People are pulling away from the common ways, not sending their children to common schools, but to private academies. This is in the elite. Mm -hmm. No longer wanting to worship together on the Sabbath, but insisting on a congregation that was closer to their own beliefs, as did Henry Thoreau's aunts and the small group who would form a Trinitarian congregation. But even as people pull back, from the common way of life, they didn't really throw off the ideology of community that bound them together. Mm -hmm. So what I'm trying to show in the book is that people are behaving in ways that fit their new felt sense of how they wanted to live, but that violated the ways they understood themselves in community. That I think is crucial to the book. You know, we talk about the rise of individualism in America, and we can talk about the first instance I described people insisting on religious choice, on a voluntary mm -hmm. choice of where they want to worship. They don't want to have to pay taxes for a congregation that's, that doesn't suit them. Well, that's an insistence on choice, but it doesn't say much about the individuals who choose. The second major form of choice is for economic interests. Why do I have to do things to suit my neighbors? Why can't I do them 
why do I follow in the footsteps of my grandfather and father to farm the land and trade work, change works with my neighbors and go to husking bees and barn raisings? If you have real work, do it yourself or hire somebody. That's an argument for individualism on the grounds of economic self-interest. But what's the wider idea of the individual? One of the things I think I um, am new in emphasizing in the book is that transcendentalists, maybe Unitarian liberal Protestants as well, imbue the idea of the individual with an idealism and power that I don't think we see argued about elsewhere in antebellum mm -hmm. culture. Mm -hmm. And that idea will prove to be enormously useful and strategic in a world, not just of religious choice, but of the many social changes I describe in the book. Mm. That's very interesting because Emerson certainly does have a very idealistic view of what each soul is part of this broader soul. I mean, I won't pretend to understanding transcendentalism, but you make it almost, it make me almost able to understand it with this book. And um, you, you, you talk, you, you mentioned John Kyes and Samuel Hoare, who are the really two pivotal figures in the 1820s and 1830s. And that's, you know, I, I think those of us who don't live in Concord the way you do may imagine it as this bucolic town and its community where everyone got along, which is certainly the way Emerson looks back on it as having been the New England town meeting where everyone essentially came to consensus. But you really show the contentiousness that was in this town, in the town meeting and in the community itself. Can you talk a little bit about Hoare and Kai's and their yeah, and, 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 and they're just in the elite policy. So yeah. um, maybe a way to approach this is to say, that I think most people imagine because of Emerson and the transcendentalists, mm -hmm. but also if you know anything about the minister as a Ripley who's there for over 60 years, you think this has got to have been, this must be a Federalist town in mm -hmm. the era of Jeffersonian um, Federalist competition. And you're looking, you think, these guys are surely Whigs. Most of Concord must be Whig. Well, it turns out it's utterly wrong. Yeah. Concord was, in the parlance of today, a battleground town. <laughs> it was in the period of the 1790s, uh, especially 1800 to 1815, 16. It was a hotly contested town in which control could swing back and forth between Jeffersonians and Federalists. Likewise, um, while Concord was pretty somnolent from 1825 to around 1833, from 1830 to, to 33 to um, the end of the 1840s, in what we think of as the height of the Jacksonian party system, Concord was again bitterly mm -hmm. divided, and more often than not, the Democrats won. Concord was mm. more likely a local foco, radical right. democratic town than anything else. So Samuel Hoare and John Kyes first represent around the 1820s, the conflict between uh, Hoare the Federalist and Kyes the Jeffersonian. But by the mid 1830s, they're both Whigs being denounced and opposed by populist Jacksonian Democrats in the town. Hmm. Let me just say two quick things about Kais and uh, Hoare. Both are Concord's representatives to the Massachusetts Constitutional Convention of 1820 and play significant roles. And Kais is not remembered and should be as the person who stood up in the Massachusetts Convention and said, I move that we have an amendment granting universal male suffrage mm -hmm. with yeah. no property qualification and none for office holder. He mm -hmm. makes that motion, then he leaves the room. Mm -hmm. And everybody says, good idea. And they vote on it while he's out of the room. And then the next day they realize, uh-oh, we just granted the vote to paupers and to transients. So there's then a, a, an amendment put in to qualify that. It's taxpayer Mm -hmm. and residents suffered. Residents of six months in um, 
I believe, the Commonwealth uh, in, in, in the town in mm -hmm. a year in the Commonwealth. Mm -hmm. but John Kyes is not remembered as the guy who no. moved uh, yeah. political democracy. Yeah. Meanwhile, Samuel Hoar is descendant of a distinguished family in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. His forebearer had been president of Harvard, and he is the defender of the standing order of Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. He defends the religious establishment. He defends property qualifications for the vote. And outside of the Constitutional Convention, in, as a state senator, he defends the privileges of the Charles River Bridge Company. Right. And that case, the conflict over the bridge, mm -hmm. turns out to have surprising significance in Concord and Middlesex County and in US history. It does. I wanted to want to come back because uh, Sam, uh, George Frisbee Hoare, the son of Samuel Hoare, knocks out John Shepard Kaiser's teeth. It, it, this, is, this is another, I guess this would be a generational um, struggle going on when they're boys. Yes. Uh, and um, so John Kais, when he starts to get a lot of political opposition, um, you know, sees his son, John Shepard, who is kind of the epitome of the frat boy, you know, child of privilege who, you know, is going to get away with every drunken episode he can, um, and yet never really suffers serious sanction. Except, you know, just to, for everybody out there, you'll read in the book that his father uh, is endlessly hectoring him about yeah. what to do, and at one point goes into John Shepard's dorm room at Harvard, opens his desk and reads his son's journals, you know, and then yeah. and then abrades him on what's recorded in the journals. Um, so he, the Kai's family and the Hoare family are at odds with each other. First, the fathers, then the sons. And it actually, the battle between the two families continues into the 1920s. When mm -hmm. women get the vote, on school board to and can serve on school committees. The Hoare family and the Kaiser pick different women to support. Wow, wow, wow. Uh, Jeff Perlman has a question about individualism and whether it plays a role in a, a gulf between social classes in Concord. Yeah, one way to describe the separation of people out from this common way of life is to look at um, the Samuel Hoare and John Kyes mm -hmm. and a number of the others in the elite who take the lead in forming the, and, and the Concord Academy as a private school. Mm -hmm. After the son of one of the founders of the academy comes home from the village grammar school, little Willie Whiting, he's about seven or eight years old, and his father looks at him after the first week of school and says, kid's black and blue. He said, what happened to you? He said, Oh, the kids beat me up in the playground. So he races off to confront the schoolmaster, who's a man named Abner Forbes, a Williams College graduate, who will go on to be the head of the Smith School in Boston, the all-black school. And um, Forbes says to Colonel William Whiting, well, if you ask me, I never send my kid to this school. You know, I as soon as sooner put him on a man of war. So Whiting then goes and finds Kai's and 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 um, or and so we got to start a new school. Mm -hmm. This is a, so. This is a form of social separation. Rather than say, let's learn to deal with this. Let's withdraw the kid. Now we'll have a school with far fewer students. It will, you know, it's key, if you will, um, to to admission is can you pay the tuition. Mm -hmm. And so you build in a social segregation and mm -hmm. that social segregation is in important ways tied to the emphasis on individualism. But I wouldn't say entirely because mm -hmm. you see this in the church separation. A lot mm -hmm. of ordinary people without much in the way of money in the world are saying, no, we get to choose. Mm -hmm. So you do have class built in but I wouldn't make that the whole story. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let's see, Richard Smith wants to know if you could talk a little bit more about the relationship between Ezra Ripley and Ralph Waldo Emerson, which it's a 
interesting, fascinating story. Well, we don't have all that much on the Ripley side, despite the fact that Ripley left us barrels of sermons, thousands of them that, you know, anybody, anybody want to know why it took so long to write this book? You read as a Ripley sermons. We'll see how soon you get time. Um, but on Emerson's side, he was predisposed to dislike Ezra Ripley as a result of the opinions communicated to him by his aunt, Mary Moody Emerson, who was a, Phyllis Cole suggests is really the kind of muse of transcendentalism and, and key to the transmission of um, dissenting ideas to Emerson from German and British authors. Uh, she doesn't like Ripley because of his rationalist view of religion and his emphasis on ethics more than spiritual uh, experience. She mocks him and actually calls him Dr. Reason, as if he's John Locke's immediate heir walking around Concord. And Emerson inherits this and is, is, is sort of weary of his grandfather. And yeah. ultimately, in the Divinity School address that Emerson gives in 1838, he will essentially condemn both Ripley and Ripley's assistant, Barzilli Frost, mm -hmm. for preaching, you know, what he would call corpse cold Unitarianism, for preaching right. a faith whose only real purpose is that everybody should worship together on the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. That was Ripley's highest ideal. You know, yeah. imagine, you know, uh, I think of Ripley as he would have been very happy as an as a Anglican country vicar. Mm -hmm. you know, that his highest vision was we gather together to thank the Lord's blessing. Right. Yeah, yeah. In many ways, that's what he was, this country yeah. vicar presiding over the, this town yeah. and attending to the spiritual needs. And I have to say, I came out with more sympathy for Barzilly Frost. And I'm, I'm thinking about men violating their nature. He's certainly not violating his nature doing what he's doing. So no, he was as dull as he was born. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but, you know, when they do ratemyprofessor.com, you know, and they say this course was dull, you know, yeah. that would have been rate, rate my preacher dot com. That's right. Yeah. Well, and people were actually rating by leaving. I know the, they're leaving for these other, uh, the Trinitarians or the, um, the various other, yeah. or Emerson and Thoreau, so let's spend the Sunday morning walking in the woods. Yeah, and, and I think it, it was amazing. So in 1825-26, when the Trinitarians withdraw, it's still the case that 85% of the people of Concord are supporting the first parish and, mm -hmm. and its, its um, church in Meeting House. By 1834, that's still pretty much the case at the time of the end of the religious establishment. Mm -hmm. By 1838, half the people of the town are no longer supporting the first parish. And Emerson says in the Divinity School Judge to describe the plight of Unitarianism, half parishes are signing off. He's mm -hmm. got the number down mm -hmm. exactly yeah. from the town of Concord. And he's got Ripley and especially Barzilli Frost in mind. His discomfort in, in, in distress over what he saw as the dullness, the sleepiness of religion in Concord, of, of religion in New England is Concord writ large. Right, yeah. By yeah. 1850, instead of 85% of the people supporting the first parish as they did in 1825, now 85% are signed off from the first parish. Amazing. And, and you know, we know a lot, and thanks to you, we know a lot more about Emerson and Thoreau, but then there are other characters who really are extraordinary, and I'm glad you've written about them. Like Mary Moody Emerson seems like a woman who would be memorable if we ran into her today. And she was she was Emerson's aunt, I think. And she was Emerson's aunt who was, was she liked to say she was in arms on April 19th because she was a newborn. Ah. And, and uh, her father, the Reverend William Emerson, the actual um, lineal grandfather of, of Ralph Waldo Emerson, um, he was the patriot preacher of Concord, strong in resistance to British tyranny, who dies on the expedition to Ticonderoga and is then succeeded by Ripley, who um, takes up the pulpit, takes up the manse, and takes up the widow. 
And, and so, um, and from his point of view, a widow who's 10 years older than me, mm-hmm. and I tell a funny story in the book about the shock of members of the congregation at having a minister who marries a woman 10 years older than he. Um, but so little Mary Moody is actually put out to be raised by kin in the town of Malden. And even after her mother remarries to Ezra Ripley, is not brought back to the mass for a long time. She sees mm. herself as she's in exile and bitterly resents that. But also growing up in Malden comes to have perhaps greater freedom to develop her own um, mind and mm-hmm. her own religious sentiments. She rem- and, but she also inherits all the stories of the Emersons and the mm-hmm. ministers who preceded them. And she, she tells Waldo, we had a glorious history. We had pastors in our family who could stand at the pulpit and, and denounce the sins of the congregation. She tells the story of one uh, member of a congregation who starts to leave as uh, den- Jeremiah and denunciation is going on. He reaches out his arms and says, stay here, you sinner. You can't leave right now. Um, and, but ministers, as she saw it in the 1820s and 30s, they're too timid. They won't speak mm-hmm. the truth as they know it. Yeah. Um, so you get women like Mary Moody Emerson, and we should emphasize that 70 to 75 percent of the members of the Concord Church are female. That's mm-hmm. likewise the percentage in the Trinitarian Church. Um, mm-hmm. It turns out when, when I ask in the book, how many women were transcendent? How many followed Emerson? Um, a lot. And you realize suddenly well, it would be really unusual if women so strong in pursuing religion, really the mainstay of mm-hmm. New England religion, of course they would also be oh, yeah. gravitating toward Emerson. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and the Thoreau, Thoreau's mother and her sisters also play a role in this, in the, the split with the congregational church. And then um, Cynthia Thoreau has an interesting life um, as well. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about these yeah. women. Well, so let me, so Cynthia Thoreau is the granddaughter of, a, of Jean Thoreau, uh, um, I'm sorry, I'm getting all my generations mixed up here. Yeah. So Cynthia Thoreau's is um, the daughter of, of Mary Jones, who marries Asa Dunbar. Okay. And Mary Jones's father is Elisha Jones, Colonel Jones of Weston, Massachusetts, who turns out to have been uh, one of the most powerful figures in late colonial Massachusetts, big landowner in Weston, big speculator in landholding, and a major figure in supporting royal government, who will in fact stay loyal to the crown as will a number of his sons. Uh, we don't learn much in Thoreau's own writing um, given his emphasis on the American Revolution, he's the grandson of a loyalist, mm-hmm. powerful, and I should add, a slaveholder. Mm-hmm. Cynthia is then uh, the granddaughter, and her own mother had married the Reverend Ace Dunbar, who is, if not a loyalist, a royalist, strongly inclined to the crown. And she never really gets to know her father, who dies uh, shortly after she's born. Um, but so she grows up uh, sort of like Emerson's uh, in situation with a mother whose minister father has died. Um, mm-hmm. And she remarries Jonas Minot of Concord, who is also a crown leaning figure during the revolution. And so um, you've got a history of gentility in that family, of status, in the colonial period, and then a kind of downward mobility. And yet living in Concord, John Thoreau and his wife Cynthia struggled to build their way back on Main Street into the company of the elite. Mm -hmm. And what I do besides talking about Cynthia here in the book is try to give readers a sense in the first half of the culture and world of the Thoreau family. Every chapter begins framed by the Thoreau. Mm-hmm. And you see that um, there's, a, there's this world 
of, on the one hand, downward mobility and you know, John Thoreau was a merchant who failed, goes back to Concord to become a manufacturer. Instead of importing goods for sale, he's now manufacturing them uh, for distribution with, within um, New England and beyond. Uh, his wife leaves the Concord church with her um, sisters-in-law, but can't accept the, do the doctrine and covenant of the new church. And so it goes back to Ezra Whipley's. So you see a woman of conscience who won't put aside her scruples, no matter what. You know, she wants spiritual piety, but she can't accept Calvinism in the strictest sense. She joins the Concord Female Charitable Society um, as a way both uh, to protect herself, should she ever fall in need, as it turned out her mother did, um, but also as a way to associate with the elite of the town as a manager. Mm -hmm. She sacrifices and keeps a boarding house, turn the money to send her children to the academy um, and, her, and to send Henry to Harvard. Her husband joins the Middlesex Society of Husbands and Manufacturers as a way of promoting his business and putting his pencils on display and winning prizes for that. So in the book, you can see, and John Thorough is a strong supporter of Henry Clay and the National Republican Party. Mm -hmm. And among its benefits to him is tariff on imported pencils. Mm -hmm. So you begin to see in the book how the Thorough family is itself very much part of this social and cultural world that will dominate the Whigs of Concord, mm -hmm. some of whom are moral reformers, others of whom are happy to have economic benefits. Right, um, right. And, and John Thoreau starts his pencil business in competition with a well-established pencil manufacturer also in Concord. With William Monroe, who's the guy who basically launches and invents the American pencil industry. And then I think it, we forget Concord's manufacturing history. You know, there was the mill dam and then uh, the, the manufacturing of pencils and then it's a um, textile industry which starts to the west of the village. I mean, the village maintained, with the destruction, taking down of the mill dam, it really creates itself as this more idyllic community when at the time of the revolution and into the early 19th century, it is this industrial center. Yeah, and center of town is, is an industrial district. It resembles um, in being lo located right by the mill with a stream, you know, being channeled under the road to create a mill pond in the center. It, it resembles as uh, the district in Roxbury Neck, you know, as you go into Boston. Yeah. And that's a pertinent analogy because um, settling along the mill dam in Concord in 1790s are men who've been trained as clockmakers by Willard right. and by Simon Willard. And so what you have on the mill dam in 1790s and down to 1815 is um, clockmakers, William Monroe, a furniture maker brought by his brother to make the cases for the clocks. You've got a brass foundry, you've got stores, you've got blacksmith shop, and you've got a grist mill in the center of town servicing the agricultural hinterland. Hmm. When that mill um, pond, when, when is abandoned and the mill uh, sluiceways are taken down, the pond in the center of town is drained off. And on the site of the old grist mill and the blacksmith shop next to it is erected the first, the Concord Bank and the hmm. insurance company. And what you have is emblematic, though, symbolically. Um, Concord goes from a town center servicing the agricultural hinterland to a center of finance capitalism. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there's a kind of a struggle then with Lowell, which becomes the big city in Middlesex County, and ultimately Concord loses the county court to yeah. Lowell. Concord's, Concord's a court town, it's the seat of government. Mm -hmm. Um, and we also forget that, you know, Concord's the center of Middlesex County. Mm -hmm. And um, when the uh, Industrial Revolution really takes off, first with the mills in Waltham and then in Lowell, 
a lot of small towns in Massachusetts are benefiting from that. Concord itself right. is, uh, has its own cotton mill opened in 18, it's chartered 18, after Jefferson's embargo. Mm -hmm. And that mill I described is surprisingly modern. By the early 1820s, you can take a bale of cotton and see it woven into cloth just as much in Concord as you could in Lowell. And mm -hmm. it will be done by young girls in their teens and 20s exactly wow. on the plan of the Lowell Mill Girls. Hmm. Um, maybe one thing I'd like to you know, add here though, um, is so you have all these changes taking place. So how is Emerson really connected to this? What is he doing? Well, I try to show in the book in the second half that Emerson is going on the lecture circuit, especially in Boston um, and offering lectures on the philosophy, series on the philosophy of history with titles on manners and culture that sound really general, but in fact are aimed at interpreting for people the social changes of their own age. Mm -hmm. um, and he does this in 1836, 37, by breaking with his own habits and practices as a lecturer. He's been a minister of the second church in Boston and he resigns that in 1832, 33, because he says, I can no longer perform as a representative of the congregation um, and, and embraces his own uh, views as a emerging transcendentalist. He'll preach, but not as a representative of the congregation. He'll make a career as a lecturer. And what he imagines is he'll be, initially, he'll be sponsored by groups, uh, by town lyceum, or in Boston by the Society of Natural History and then the Society for the Diffusion of Useful Knowledge. Then suddenly in 1836, he says, no, I'm gonna announce a series of lectures on my own. I'm gonna print up the tickets. I'm gonna have them sold in Boston. I'll hire the Masonic Temple as the place to give them. And I'll hire somebody to take care of the lighting and be, let people into the door. He'll come out on his own. What he's doing is suddenly saying, I'm an entrepreneur, an individual, going into the market by myself mm -hmm. where I'll peddle my ideas. I'll cobble together the lectures in Concord and I'll bring them to market in Concord, like a Concord farmer, if you will, with their crops. And what is his central theme in those lectures? The rise of the individual. He says in those lectures, um, he gives you know, 10 or 11 of them, the last one is the individual. The best work of society, he says, is the formation of the individual. And so to be a prophet of individualism is to interpret his own existence as much as the lives, experiences of his neighbors. Fascinating. Uh, let's see, Susan Lively asks if you can briefly give us the difference between the Concord of the Minutemen and the Concord of Emerson and Thoreau. Sure, well, the um, town of Concord is bigger by the 1830s, about 2,000 people. Um, mm -hmm. In 17, on the eve of the revolution, it's about 1,600 people, but about 10% of those will be um, lost when the town of Carlisle is created as a, as a separate district. Um, but I think the key thing is in terms of values, the town of Concord you know, on the eve of the revolution, 1775, it's defending its corporate existence. It's the revocation of the right of self-rule that's crucial. Self-rule will become self-reliance in the world of Emerson in the 1830s. Um, it's a town now where people are separated from each other in a, a variety of groups. Uh, no one could, could um, and, and not just in groups in voluntary societies, all of which the Lyceum, the Agricultural Society, the Social Library are emphasizing um, abandonment of the customs and practices of the grandfathers, or at least unthinking abandon, uh, following of those practices, the urging change. They weren't doing that in 1775. Um, mm -hmm. It's also a world where um, there's an emphasis now, far greater emphasis 
that schools should be exposing students to the current knowledge of the day. Their aim shouldn't just be to inculcate religious piety and morals and rudimentary literacy. There's a sense, I think, that um, in the 1820s and 30s, that we live in a world of expanding horizons. You know, maybe it's just think the equivalent of you've got the internet. Look at the whole world that you can examine. Mm -hmm. you know, your textbooks should not be Noah Webster's Speller and Jedi Morse geography. You've got to get new textbooks today. You've got to keep up with the latest knowledge. And so um, it's also a world, this would be crucially, of far more transiency and fluidity. You know, in the colonial period, that meant warning people out. In the 1830s and 40s, that means you don't know who most people mm -hmm. are. When Concord commemorated its bicentennial in 1835, two thirds of the people there hadn't been born in Concord. So it's a world of strangers as well. Yeah, that's something actually that the Concord Freeman laments that they, they want to boycott the, the bicentennial yeah. because for a lot of reasons, the one being these aren't the original people of Concord. Right, right. And, and that's sort of like the, the new elite is overlooking the sturdy old just, um, farmers of the town and, and mechanics who are mm -hmm. the descendants we really should be honoring. Hmm. Let's see, Suzanne Fitzpatrick asks about the Vermont transcendentalists and if there's a connection between those transcendentalists and the, those of Concord, if you know. Uh, I can't speak to that very much, but I bet, I bet she can. <laughs> um, I, I, I know a little bit, but not enough to summon up yeah. any thoughts <laughs> on the subject. Okay, okay. One of the, uh, uh, there are so many great little stories in here, and one one of the ones I found most interesting was Harriet Moore apparently baked pies for all of the inmates in the jail that her father kept on Thanksgiving. Not only did she bake pies for the inmates, she made sure that each got all three: mince, apple, and pumpkin. And she um. They, one of the things that I had fun with the book, I hope came across to you and to other readers, is I was able to reconstruct whole families over time. Mm -hmm. So you, you know about the parents and then you know about the children. And her father, Abel Moore, was one of the most successfully acquisitive men in the town of Concord, who is a pretty good example of a newcomer, not that he was new mm -hmm. to New England, he was born in the town of Sudbury and came to Concord from uh, one of the other neighboring Middlesex towns, um, initially to be a deputy sheriff uh, and, and then the jailkeeper. Um, but that job as deputy sheriff and jailkeeper allowed him to use his natural talents as an, to be an auctioneer, to, um, to know when uh, people's land was going to be foreclosed and sold at auction. And he started, um, and also he got lots of fees mm -hmm. and he got to be pretty rich. He was a driving force in the mill dam company that would um, take down the old mill, drain the thing in the center of town. He takes the profits from his job and his speculations, buys up the land of the old Prescott family which has been terribly run down, where mm -hmm. it said that the only thing you could raise there were bullfrogs and um, drains it all. And um, some of it's too wet and has to be uh, filled up with, with soil and, and um, other parts are too dry and have to have the wetlands move there. He marches the soldiers from, uh, he marches the inmates from mm -hmm. the jail to do his labor for him. He all, um, and so there's Harriet in a pleasant story of community. She's baking the um, pies for the inmates. And there's the father marching them out to do his labor. And there are people who comment in town, they doubted that he was paying much for that labor. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that kind of is a contrast then with Thoreau raising beans on his little plot at Baldwin. And you make this into, it's a reverse of, yeah, you know, the idea of agricultural improvement was a rife one in the early 19th century and doing exactly the kinds of thing that Abel Moore was doing, that is improving the land. And Thoreau is you know, taking the sandy soil and growing beans. It's kind of a reverse of the 
Yes. And one of the ways we can measure the difference between Emerson and Thoreau is that Emerson admires Abel Moore's capacity to act on the world, you know, to actually make you know, hills and rivers and, and uh, men and Irishmen all march to his tomb to move mm -hmm. gravel one way and wetland mm -hmm. the other. And, and Abel Moore by 1840 has, is winning prizes and will become as the model farmer for all. Uh, Benjamin, uh, Henry Coleman in his agricultural report from Massachusetts on Middlesex County singles Abel Moore out. Well, and what is Abel Moore growing, among other things, English hay? Mm -hmm. What does Thoreau use as a symbol of the cash crop that he despises, but English hay? And I'm yeah. sure he knew he had, he had Abel Moore in mind, mm -hmm. and he, I'm sure he was tweeting Emerson between the yeah. lines. Um, yeah. 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 Emerson, you pointed out, was the ninth richest taxpayer in Concord, that is, he inherited from his late wife, his first wife. And most of his money was in stocks and bonds. And not that there's necessarily, do you, by the way, do you like Thoreau more than you like Emerson? Um, I think one finds Thoreau more authentic. He, you know, he's irascible. I mean, actually, I think like mm -hmm. is difficult. Okay. Um, I've known people in my life, I had a colleague at Amherst College, who I think um, had a kind of, moral um, conscience, or maybe I would say imperiousness, that um, you felt that you'd always have to live up or be judged in his eyes. Mm -hmm. People referred to Thoreau, he had those terrible eyes. I think, you know, mm -hmm. they always might have felt that they were being judged. Um, if they were being judged by Emerson, he was a remote judge. You couldn't, you know, he had a kind of visage that I think didn't reveal his condemnation as readily. I just read yesterday a document that I wish I had read when writing the book, which Emerson sends a note to a convention in Boston in fall of 1846, which is organizing uh, an early vigilance committee to rescue enslaved uh, uh, Blacks who have been enslaved and made their way to Massachusetts to rescue them from being rendered back to the South. And Emerson writes a letter of support and he says, if, if I have to give up all the fruits of my investments and I have to just go chop trees and live in the woods, I'll take my sons and, and children and do that. And you think, that's just a fantasy on his part, mm -hmm. but it's real for Thoreau. Right, that's a good point. Um, I think um, we can talk just a little bit. I, I, you know, we are probably exhausting your patience. Um, about the writing of history. You have a lot about Lemuel Shattuck who compiles the first real history of Concord. And you say he compiles, amasses facts. And then Emerson is the one who in his lectures on Concord history kind of puts this into a, um, an interpretive form. I mean, what have you learned over the course of this about writing history? Um, it's hard. <laughs> and I think I learned a couple of things. One is that however much you gather evidence and data and count, you've got to write a narrative. Every sentence is a narrative. It tells a story, it's got a subject and a verb, maybe an object. But, but to tell the story well, one Emerson emphasizes, it's gonna depend upon your vision of human nature. Secondly, it's going to depend upon your sense of your audience. What do you, you know, no matter how faithfully I'm trying to recover the world of the early 19th century, I'm writing it for people in, you know, going on the third decade of mm -hmm. the 21st century. Second is, it's always crucial to recover the framework within which people make their choices. Sometimes they're not aware of all the things in their framework. And the way it's really struck me is that time and again, if I were to say, when I describe the Concord Lyceum, 
It's common among historians. They just say, here's the Lyceum, here are its goals, and here are the lectures that people gave to it. And, and these were the themes and these were the speakers. Well, it hit me. People got a lot of things to do with their leisure time. They don't have to go to the Lyceum. In fact, the Lyceum promoted itself for lectures on the natural world. And, and one famous one was by a local on all the animals of creation. But they were traveling zoos. You, could, you didn't have to sit in a room. You could go out to the town common and see a camel there, see an elephant. So I learned that everything I described, I would try to give you the framework of choice within which people acted. And that that, I think, gives the narrative much more energy and force to it. And finally, as you say, um, on the one hand, I suspended my point of view of my own point um, values. But on the other hand, I tried to always give both a sense of the choice people are making in their lives, but the consequences those choices would have for everybody around them. Thank you. We've been talking with Bob Gross, author of The Transcendentalists and Their World. And in addition to now being a member of the Colonial Society for 36 years, he also has been a mainstay of our graduate student forum. He, in fact, was the moderator one year and Every year he has been a diligent member of the committee framing questions and helping the students understand what their point is. And so I wanna thank you for that. And also wanna mention that we've just posted the call for papers for next year's forum, and which is on June 2nd and 3rd, but you're going to be traveling to Iceland, so you won't be there, but June 2nd and 3rd, if you know of any graduate students who could benefit from this, please send them our way. And so thank you, Bob, for joining us. Well, thank you. And I'm just sorry we couldn't all be in, um, on Vernon Street and having a glass of wine after. I hope so. I'm sorry for that, too. But thank you. This is fun. And I will recommend that everyone now read the book. Thanks so much. Take care, Bob. Bye-bye.